everybody. My name is Kim Holder, and I'm the director of the Center for Economic Education and Financial Literacy at the University of West Georgia. We're excited to have some very special guests with us today to talk about facing the future. Um, we'll hit on some economic policy, a little bit about the, the uh, federal debt deficit, all your big hot macro economics topics that you want to talk about today. We're excited to have with us um, two members from the Concord Coalition. We have Phil Smith, a friend of the center, um, who's our who's the national field director at the Concord Coalition. And we have Steve Robinson, who's the chief economist at the Concord Coalition. They've brought with them some friends. Um, we have Romina Bacha, who is at the Cato Institute, where she's the director of budget and entitlement policy. And we have Ben Geddes, who's the associate director at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Center. We're really excited to have you here with us today, and I'll turn it over to Phil to get us started. Thank you so much, Kim, and it's a pleasure to be uh, with everyone at the University of West Georgia. It's a special place uh, for lots of reasons to do this virtual event today, uh, not the least of which is uh, my colleague Steve Robinson uh, attended the University of West Georgia, graduated from there. It's his alma mater. So uh, when we started assembling these things and looking at different college campuses and Kim and I started talking, we thought that's the perfect place for one of these is the University of West Georgia. So I'm coming to you today from Fresno, California. Uh, it's actually a very busy week for the Concord Coalition. We're doing these events on campuses across the nation. Uh, I'll be uh, here at Fresno State uh, tomorrow and also tomorrow in Austin, Texas at the LBJ School at the University of Texas. So uh, we're doing these forums and trying to educate people about federal budget policy, which really plays to the mission of the Concord Coalition. So we were actually founded 30 years ago uh, by both a Democrat and a Republican. So we've always been very, very bipartisan. And to commemorate our 30th anniversary, we are attempting to get on 30 different college campuses uh, throughout the year uh, to spread the message about the need to be educated about federal budget policy, and also to look at some of the unsustainable trends that we have with, with fiscal policy, and hopefully maybe figure out a way to do something about it. So back in 1992, there were two former U.S. Senators, Paul Songus and Warren Rudman, uh, Democrat and Republican, who got together with former Commerce Secretary Pete Peterson. And they thought there ought to be a group out there to help educate people about these issues. When the two senators were in office, lots of times people would come in and ask for more spending on this or more spending on this, very valuable programs oftentimes. And then we'd have other constituents come up and say, we would love tax cuts here or tax cuts there. But there were very few people who would come to Washington and say, would you make sure those things at least somewhat add up over the long haul? And so uh, that's one of the things that we look at. We look at both revenues, we look at spending, and we look at these trends. Uh, for today's session, in addition to our live audience, which we appreciate you guys being here, this is being recorded. So our audience is even larger than it appears today. Uh, and I would encourage you, if you're interested in these issues, to please check out our website at concordcoalition.org. We also have a weekly podcast and a newsletter that goes out. So don't be surprised if you ask some questions today, if you wind up on our podcast, uh, we'd love to have you sometime. So without further ado at this time, I'd like to turn it over to our panelists and we have some interesting discussion for you today. Make sure you uh, think up some good questions for these panelists because they are experts. They're coming to you from our nation's capital. And one of the things that we try to do at the Concord Coalition that differentiates us from, from other groups in Washington is to get out across the country. And so this is one thing that we're very pleased to do today is to, to get these nationally renowned experts uh, to you in Georgia and across the country. So without further ado, uh, we will now start with our panel discussion. Our first panelist uh, will be uh, Romina from the Cato Institute. Romina, thank you so much. Thank you, Phil. Um, I'm Romina Bacha. I'm based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Before joining Cato about three months ago, I spent uh, almost 10 years at the Heritage Foundation, primarily working on federal budget issues. I'm particularly excited to take your questions today. So uh, please make note of anything that's confusing or even political and provocative questions that have been on your mind that you've just been waiting to throw at experts. I think that can be uh, the most exciting part of today's panel. So take advantage of us being here live and, uh, and put questions in the chat. Feel free to do so during my presentation as well. And then we can get to it during the panel portion. I have a couple of slides that I want to share with you just to give you a general overview of what's happening uh, with the federal budget. Uh, 
So I'm going to get that lined up uh, right now. And uh, my big takeaway for you today is that federal debt is too high and growing. And um, that is troubling because on the one hand, it threatens a fiscal crisis in the United States during which investors who buy US government bonds may lose confidence in the US dollar and dump those treasury holdings, which could um, trigger out of control inflation, so-called hyperinflation uh, with severe uh, consequences for the economy and the American people. And uh, while no one can say when such a fiscal crisis could occur or at what level of debt we are in deep waters. Um, when fiscal crises do occur, they tend to do so um, suddenly and uh, and, and uh, escalating quickly. So it's a it's a it's a scenario that we want to avoid uh, rather than debating exactly what the thresholds are, which is a futile attempt because so much of it rests on <clears throat> the psychology of investors. Uh, but yeah, federal debt is too high and growing, and we'll talk about what's driving that growth in the debt. In addition to threatening a fiscal crisis, um, high and growing debt, particularly as it reaches the level of a nation's economy and then continues to grow past that, undermines economic growth and prosperity today. So in a, in a, in a less worse scenario than a, a fiscal crisis, we still find ourselves suffering from having accumulated such high and growing debt. Um, and spending is driving this growth in the debt. And the major entitlements, entitlement programs, Social Security and Medicare, are the primary drivers of this growing spending. So to get debt under control, we need to control spending. And that means reforming the major entitlement programs, Social Security and Medicare. Uh, but put it, thinking about the debt in terms of trillions of dollars can be a bit overwhelming because no, none of us deal in trillions of dollars. Um, so I decided to use this depiction of the public debt instead. Public debt is only the debt that we have borrowed in credit markets. That is the most economically relevant debt. And that debt um, is, uh, as you can see, for a child born in 2022 is at 73 thousand US dollars. So for anyone who got excited about their 10 or $20,000 of student loan debt relief, um, just know that you've been saddled with a lot more debt when it comes to the federal debt. Uh, now, no one is uh, talking about just evenly distributing the federal debt and asking people to pay off their share. But if, if in a hypothetical scenario, that would be the share of each individual in the United States, regardless of age. And then you can see that it's on a steep uh, growth trajectory over the next 30 years, growing to exceed more than $200,000 per individuals. And these uh, numbers have been adjusted uh, for inflation. So um, this is the scenario that we're facing. Um, and let's talk a little bit about why the debt is growing at this rate. So my next graphic shows that. Um, we don't just have a debt problem right now that is growing, but also what underlies some of this debt. So the budget deficit in fiscal year 2021, the deficit is what we add to the debt on an annual basis. Deficit describes the difference between what the government spent and what the government collected in revenue in any given year. That's what we refer to as the deficit. And then the cumulative deficit, so each year's deficit, gets added to the national debt. And the federal debt is what we refer to as the accumulation of deficits over time. So what we're looking at here, instead of debt per capita, which was our previous chart, is actually the debt in trillions of dollars. Um, the fiscal year 2022 deficit, which we just concluded at the end of September, actually dropped significantly. It's, it's about half of the fiscal year 2020, 2021 deficit. So $1.4 trillion, uh, but I, I would like to say it's not because we started becoming more frugal and spending less, but rather that uh, we've come out of the, the largest portion of the COVID pandemic where we saw a massive increase in emergency spending and pretty much all of that decrease in the deficit can be attributed to 
that ramping down of COVID emergency measures. Uh, but we're still continuing to amass huge deficits every year based on uh, regular spending that is um, on the docket absent such emergencies. Um, so another way to look at the national debt is looking at the uh, gross federal debt, which is what you see here, that recently exceeded $31 trillion, actually, so this uh, chart is slightly outdated. Um, and at that rate, it makes up 130% of GDP or our economy. It's about one third larger than the size of the US economy. And that is those one of those levels that economists like Re Reinhardt and Rogoff have identified as particularly troubling in dragging down um, uh, the economy. But even that level of debt, which includes debt that we owe to social security and other trust funds that the federal government is responsible for, um, is, is doesn't give us a full picture of the so-called unfunded obligations that the federal government has assumed in particularly the two major entitlement programs, Social Security and Medicare, and those unfunded obligations, if we don't reform these entitlement programs, will add to the debt. And those unfunded obligations, that, that $73 trillion figure, are the long-term unfunded obligations um, over a 75-year horizon, which is what the trustees use to map out our obligations to Social Security and Medicare in the absence of reform. So those will be some of the main drivers of our debt. Um, I also want to be very clear that often we hear, well, let's just increase taxes, particularly on the rich. Shouldn't that solve the problem? Um, if you look at a historical picture and also projecting out into the future of federal spending versus federal revenue, you find that spending is far outpacing revenue growth uh, going back to 1965 and looking out into the future. So it's not that we don't have enough revenue, it's that we have too much spending. And every time the government collects more revenue, it's often more likely to also um, increase spending. So I don't believe that that is a sustainable solution. But if that hasn't convinced you, I would like to just uh, make that point even, even more clearly. Uh, one, there it is. That even when the federal government has um, imposed different tax rates, especially on top income earners, the so-called wealthy, um, the percentage of the economy that the government has been able to collect in revenue has remained relatively flat. That is sort of an interesting juxtaposition because you would think when the government um, uh, tax people at 91 cents on the dollar for the highest income earners at the, at the highest levels, that the government should be able to collect more revenue than with say a tax rate of 37% on the highest incomes which is what we currently have in place. But there's actually a stronger correlation with the uh, strength of our economy and how much the government is able to collect in taxes than there is with what tax rates the federal government is imposing on the highest earners. So they're not like sitting ducks just waiting to pay more in taxes. When you um, impose punitively high tax rates, as I would describe, especially the 91 cents on the dollar uh, back in the 60s, you um, deter people from making productive investments. You encourage them from shielding their assets from taxation by moving some of their uh, holdings and economic activity abroad. And uh, the other thing that uh, we need to look at is a variety of uh, detrimental loopholes that we should close to, um, to expand the base of taxation, but higher tax rates are not uh, a silver bullet to deal with our current um, federal spending issues. And uh, I, I just also want to highlight how we got to this place, because oftentimes there's this belief that, well, the US government spends more on defense than many other countries combined. And while that is true, and the US does have a global role to play uh, in providing defense and commercial services um, in, in international oceans, et cetera, um, defense spending um, as a percentage of the budget has actually remained relatively flat. What has grown tremendously are so-called social and economic programs that includes the major entitlements, Social Security and Medicare, but also a number of non-defense 
uh, programs, including um, welfare programs that were launched uh, in the 1960s and have grown vastly in size and scope as the federal government has assumed more responsibilities over um, the uh, so-called general welfare, uh, very loosely defined, and has expanded to meet more human wants and needs than very specifically defined core priorities that were envisioned by the founders for the federal government, primarily uh, defense and the regulation of commerce, we have seen this vast expansion in government spending. And I think at the most basic level, it comes down to the fact that human wants and needs are unlimited. And when you have a government that tries to meet as many uh, human wants and needs as possible, you inevitably end up with an unbound uh, government. And so you can see this very clearly in this graphic. Uh, which we'll be updating soon, uh, because this one also only goes until 2015. But you can see that clear trend of an expansion um, in the federal, in the scope of the federal government and its operations, and how that has driven um, the growth in spending. I'm going to stop sharing right now, and I just want to uh, wrap up by saying, given that federal spending is too high and growing. And it's primarily as a result of growing spending, which is driven by economic and social programs with Medicare and Social Security in the lead. Um, and the reasons for that are the aging of the population, as well as uh, more generous benefits that are automatically adjusted for inflation, um, and also the fact that those programs aren't very well targeted. We provide entitlement benefits to um, populations, in many cases, regardless of need and significant subsidies towards retirement health care and also uh, cash, um, regardless uh, of need, so-called universal programs. Uh, those are the primary drivers of spending in those programs. And for Medicare in particular, it's the, um, the growth in health care costs. So knowing that those are the primary drivers, how do we get the budget under control? Entitlement reform is the only sustainable answer. And um, just some, uh, some high level approaches there for both social security and Medicare, I think it's overdue that we increase the retirement age because Americans are living much longer, healthier lives. So it makes sense for them to work longer, uh, not just collect benefits for longer, especially since those benefits are paid for by younger working generations. Lower and middle income workers in particular are burdened with very high payroll taxes and increasing those taxes yet further makes it more difficult for those populations to save for their own needs, uh, to meet their own emergencies and to provide for their children. Um, the other uh, major reform in both programs is to, in Medicare, reduce the subsidies that higher income earners receive toward their health care and in Social Security, also making the benefit formula more progressive in the sense that um, benefits are targeting those individuals who need help in old age the most to prevent against old age poverty instead of giving the largest Social Security benefits to the highest earners. Um, that is uh, unnecessarily costly and especially with increased life expectancies uh, is becoming highly unaffordable. Higher earners also tend to have longer life expectancies. So uh, that's where a lot of uh, expensive, that's where a lot of the expenses are, are going. And then on the Medicare side in particular, it's important to reduce the cost of healthcare, which um, I think the, one of the most effective ways there is to empower consumers more to make better healthcare choices and also to uh, increase the share of healthcare that is financed through things like um, health savings accounts and by individuals themselves, focusing um, health insurance and what health insurance covers more on uh, catastrophic needs, really high cost needs rather than uh, regular, more regular. Um, uh, medical visits and, and treatments where we can really benefit from having more transparency in pricing and consumers be more involved um, to help reduce costs in healthcare. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Romina. We appreciate that. And now we'll turn it over to Ben. Thank you, Phil. Uh, thank you, everyone.
for having me here today. Uh, my name is Ben Giddes, and I'm an Associate Director for Economic Policy at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Romina laid out kind of big picture, what's the problem and the role of entitlements in raising our spending and, and deficits. Um, although we're facing these problems today, uh, the, the country also faces a number of immediate problems, such as high rates of poverty, financial uh, insecurities, and as a result, there's still a number of demands on the government uh, to provide support to workers and families, um, which uh, would include uh, additional spending. So the question is, um, how do we do this responsibly? And so I'm going to talk about a handful of uh, policies focus on workers and families um, and go through um, kind of the interest, a little bit of the intricacies of those issues and what would be a fiscally responsible approach to each of them. So the first one I'm going to talk about is paid family leave. Paid family leave. Um, the United States is the only developed country in the world to not have a paid parental leave benefit um, for its workers. And in the private sector, only 25% of workers get paid family leave from their employer. Um, having a paid family leave program has been a priority, uh, uh, largely on the left, but increasingly on the right as well, as it has a number of benefits to um, the uh, child development, it helps maternal health, it improves female career outcomes, and it strengthens labor force participation, and in turn could support economic growth. Um, however, the way the most common uh, format that policymakers would have paid family leave take is um, essentially a, a new large social insurance program like Social Security, um, where the government would send out checks and uh, fund the, those checks with a new payroll tax. Um, the issue that the issue with that is that that type of approach can be quite costly. Um, for instance, one bill, the Family Act, would cost about five hundred fifty billion dollars over ten years. So how do we do provide paid family leave in a fiscally responsible way? Um, well, the, the short answer is we got to find a way to pay for it. Um, like some of the, it's like a social insurance proposal. One common proposal is to have uh, a new payroll tax that would fund those benefits. Um, a uh, a benefit that replaces about two thirds of wages uh, would require a payroll tax of about one percent. Um, another option is to find offsets and spending elsewhere in the budget, which is politically very difficult to do. And then another option is to figure out ways for workers to fund their own paid leave. Um, there's a proposal from Senator Marco Rubio that would have uh, workers pull forward early Social Security retirement benefits when they take paid leave and in turn uh, decide to delay their retirement by um, a comparable amount. There's other proposals to pull forward payments in the child tax credit and in turn decide to have uh, a lower child tax credit payment for the following years. And there are also proposals to create new savings accounts for workers to um, say put aside money in anticipation of future paid leave needs. Um, so there are things like that. The other important thing when considering paid leave policy um, or considering a responsible paid leave policy is to ensure that it is targeted to workers. The reason that paid leave one of the main objectives of paid leave is to support labor force participation and economic growth, um, which in turn could have positive effects on the budget with a greater supply of workers. Um, so in order to do that, it's important to make sure that the paid leave benefit is uh, goes to people who are who have been employed by their uh, by their firm for um, six to twelve months and have adequate work history to, so that it is well targeted on folks who are in the middle of their careers and who would face a major career disruption if they don't have paid leave, because often without paid leave, workers simply just leave their job, um, resulting in a much longer career disruption than say six to 12 weeks uh, time away from work uh, in order to address family needs or if they have a child. So that's paid family leave. The other issue that's been, uh, fairly relevant and of interest lately is the child tax credit. Now the child tax credit is a flat uh, benefit payment that is a flat payment of up to $2,000 available through the tax code uh, that goes to families with children. And it's a $2,000 per child payment. There's been a lot of interest in increasing the child tax credit and making it more generous for lower income families 
as a way to reduce poverty, particularly child poverty. And last year, uh, lawmakers did enact a temporary one-year expansion in the child tax credit that would um, that that would increase that increased this maximum benefit to up to thirty six hundred dollars per child from two thousand dollars, and it also importantly eliminated any kind of in earnings phase in for the child tax credit. So typically, the child tax credit phases in with earnings until it reaches the two thousand dollar maximum. Last year's reform eliminated that phase. And so if you had $0 in earnings, you could receive up to $3,600. So how do we judge this policy? Well, this is a, a policy of uh, inherent trade-offs. So um, at $3,600 uh, without a phase in, that uh, many estimated that reduced child poverty by up to uh, 33 to 36%. So that's a big you know, positive impact on the well-being of low-income households. But without having that phase in, um, it also could have could have had a negative impact on workforce participation, um, which could weaken our economic growth and also um and also have a long-term negative impact on self-sufficiency and well-being over the long term for the households who are impacted. Um, the other thing that's important to note is that that, and particularly relevant to this discussion, that reform to the child tax credit was quite expensive, um, roughly $100 billion for one year expansion of the child tax credit, and it would cost about $100 billion per year to, if lawmakers were to continue that expansion going forward. Um, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is on the flip side of policies that have the potential to have a negative impact on our budgetary outlook is a policy that could have a positive impact, um, and that's immigration reform um, and increasing the flows of immigrants we have coming into this country. So um, underlying a, many of the trends that Romina displayed in her charts is an issue of demographics. We have Medicare and Social Security growing because we have an aging population. We have a big group of baby boomers who are entering retirement age and leaving the workforce and beginning to claim social security. Um, just a few numbers to put a little, just to give you some context. In 2019, there are 52 million adults 65 and older. By 2060, that figure will nearly double to 95 million. Um, and as a result, our workforce participation rate has steadily declined since 2000, which was weakened, um, which has been one of the reasons that has restrained economic growth. Um, and restraint, it also restrains our, the government, the government's ability to raise revenue because with fewer workers, we have less of a wage base to, to raise revenue from. Um, and then also importantly, programs like social security, um, have had fewer workers to support it. So in 1970, there were 3.7 workers per social security beneficiary that has declined to 2.6 workers per beneficiary today and is well declined to 2.1 by 2040. So there are fewer workers paying into the programs like Social Security relative to the number of workers who are claiming it or the number of retirees who are claiming it. Um, now this brings us to immigration policy. Why is immigration pro policy relevant? Um, with so many workers retiring and um, we are, uh, immigration policy is an opportunity to start offsetting these trends and provide more younger workers into the workforce who can um, help support economic growth and um, and also serve as a source of revenue for many of these programs and support these programs. Um, so as an example, immigrants are more likely than native workers uh, to be in the workforce. 66.6% .6 of foreign born workers are in the labor force compared to 61.3% of native born adults. Um, they're also 80% more likely to start businesses. Um, and in general, with these positive effects on economic growth, uh, immigrants can be a source of supporting, again, supporting revenues and uh, assisting these programs to become more fiscally sustainable. Um, however, over the last seven or so years, um, the, 
our, our flows of immigrants into this country have plummeted. In 2016, we have to, before 2016, we used to have about a million immigrants coming to this country every year. In 2021, we only had 244,000 new residents. Um, that was a that's a long gradual decline that was in part as a result of um, the COVID-19 pandemic and economic um, recession, um, but is uh, but is also reflects uh, limitations in immigration processing and decisions and policy that have uh, restrained immigration for the United States. So it's really important that. Uh, for our fiscal sustainability and our economic growth, that lawmakers begin to um, amend our broken legal immigration system so that we have uh, a stronger source of workers uh, entering into the economy and supporting both our economic growth and our uh, social programs. With that, I'll leave it for our next speaker. Thank you so much, Ben. And Steve, before we turn it over to you, I just want to give a special shout out to uh, Ms. Pamela Roach and her high school economics class is joining us. So if you'll see Pam there uh, represents about uh, you know 20 or 30 students uh, from her high school class. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. We're depending on you, the next generation, to help solve some of these problems. So we really re appreciate your participation. So with that, Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, look, there's Pam's class. That's awesome. Pam, that's a lot of folks there. So uh, we hope you have some good questions uh, for our panelists here at the end. And, our, and, certainly last, and certainly last but not least is Steve Robinson from the Concord Coalition. So Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Phil. So, you know, as, as Romina and Ben have sort of outlined, you know, we have a, a, a large number of existing programs that are causing uh, a fiscal problem. And of course, as, as Ben outlined, their demands, interests, desires to do additional things, uh, particularly in, in the area of parental leave and, and some other programs. So, you know, I, I'm going to take a step back, though, as opposed to focusing on specifically what the, the programs and issues are. And I'm going to sort of look at a, a slightly bigger picture, which is to say, um, you know, what, what are the, uh, you know, so to start with the question of, you know, the, the national debt matters, and the question is, how much does it matter? Um, and let's let's try this. Um, okay. So I, I published some research back earlier this year, and I, I entitled it Passing the Buck, How the National Debt Burdens the Future Generations. And, you know, from, from one perspective, if the government doesn't pay for it now, it has to pay for it later. So if you, you know, if you have a credit card and you run up your credit card, and you get a bill at the end of the month, uh, you know, the argument is, well, you borrowed all this money, you got all these things, now you've got the bill come due and you have to pay for it. And so that's, you know, one way to think about the national debt on a personal level is, is just your credit card. It's the country's credit card. We borrow money and we have to pay it back. At least that's the assumption. And so the question is, if you keep rolling this over and you don't pay it back, eventually you die and you leave your bills to your kids. And the question is, well, then the kids have to pay it off. And that's sort of the, the, the analogy that people often use is we're passing the buck, we're passing the burden of the national debt from the current generation on to future generations. So, you know, let's step back and say, well, why does the government borrow money? And I, although it's at the very bottom, uh, it actually perhaps should be at the top. I, I, I say at the, the, at the very last uh, bottom, path of least resistance. And that is that you know nobody likes paying taxes because you know that's your money and you'd rather spend it. And if the government takes it, you don't like uh, you don't like paying paying more money. Uh, but by the same token, people who receive government benefits, whether you're a student collecting a you know a Pell Grant or a student loan, or you're a senior collecting Social Security, nobody wants to give up their benefits. And that's the fundamental tension that politicians have to deal with. Um, nobody wants to pay more, but nobody wants to get less. Uh, but in the context of a broader economy, why does the government borrow? Well, obviously, uh, you know, as we're seeing in, in the news these days, you have wars and you have emergencies. You've got the, the war in Ukraine. You know, we've had some hurricanes recently with a lot of destruction in Florida. The government's going to help people rebuild. Of course, the COVID pandemic, uh, that, that obviously affects the economy and affects the budget. 
Uh, if you have a recession, you know, obviously fewer people are working, they're going to pay less taxes. Uh, if they're not working, they're going to collect unemployment benefits, so spending goes up. Now, there is another argument for why the government borrows, and that's in terms of you know, uh, investment. And obviously, we built the interstate highway system, we build roads and bridges, we pay for people's education, we do research, uh, the National Institutes for Health do medic does medical research, NASA does research on you know, space and exploration. So obviously, you know, there are all sorts of reasons why the government would want to borrow money. Uh, and there are obviously arguments why we should borrow money at certain times. But by the same token, you know, do, do we just keep running up the debt and never pay it off? Or do we at some point say, well, let's, let's pay it off? And there's some arguments there. And that is, does government borrowing matter? Um, and, and there's two sides to the argument. One is that, well, no, it doesn't really matter. And the other argument is, well, yes, it does matter. And uh, on the no side, people say, well, you know, after World War II, uh, the national debt as a share of our economy uh, was about 100%. So we owed as much money as the economy produced in a year back after World War II. And we didn't go on a, a programmatic, you know, we didn't systematically try to pay down the debt. What, what happened after World War II was the economy grew very strongly through the 50s and the 60s and, and into the 1970s. And so the economy grew and it would be sort of like, you know, as I mentioned before, if you, if you borrow money and you run up your credit card, that's going to be a big problem. But if the same time you're running up your credit card, you get a new job and you get a pay raise, well, then maybe that credit card bill isn't quite as burdensome because you now have more money. And so the argument is, well, that's what happened to the U.S. is that we sort of grew our way out of, out of the debt. Uh, the problem is, as Ben pointed out, though, is that because of the demographics and because of the lack of immigration, the economy is not going to grow as much in the future as it has in the past. Plus the fact that if we're running up the debt faster than the economy is growing, you can't really grow your way out of it. Now, there are a few economists who came along and said, well, you know, it's really no big deal. We're borrowing all this money, but at some point we got to pay it off. But that's no problem because the people that we're going to pay it off is, is ourselves. We, we borrowed the money from ourselves and we'll just pay ourselves back. And, and you know, that's a wash. Uh, now, I'll suggest in just a moment why that's not true. But let's look at the, 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 the yes questions. Why does the government borrowing matter? And as Romina pointed out, uh, government borrowing can be inflationary. It can cause a fiscal crisis. Uh, if, if, if for suddenly interest rates were to go up um, because people are less confident about buying bonds, uh, with 30 trillion in debt, every one percentage point in interest rate is $300 billion. So you can see if interest rates go up very much, we're gonna spend all our money on interest on the debt. And then of course, the last argument for why the debt matters is this crowding out argument or investment. And that is that, you know, everybody wants to borrow money. You wanna borrow money to buy a car, buy a house, businesses wanna borrow money to expand. Well, if the government comes in and they borrow money, there's less money for everybody else. And so the argument is, that government borrowing crowds out private borrowing. Uh, and so this crowding out argument is one that economists often focus on as to what is the long run effects of, of the deficit. And so what I did is I said, well, how do you estimate? What is the crowding out effect? And, um, and so, right, oh, I'm sorry, right before I get to that. So when people talk about the national debt and we owe it to ourselves, this is a picture of the national debt measured as a share of our economy. And you can see back in 1970, it was around 30%. And now it's up uh, close to 125%. This is the debt divided into categories. And roughly today, about a quarter of the debt is held by the public. So that's pension funds, insurance companies, individuals who buy U.S. savings bonds. Uh, that's the blue area, the, the orange area. That's the Federal Reserve. That's our central bank. And because of the, the financial crisis in 2008 and because of the pandemic, the Federal Reserve has been buying a lot of, debt, a lot of the debt. And row doesn't refer to rowing your boat, it refers to the rest of the world. That's the gray area. And that you can see, we borrow a lot of money. We borrow from Japan, we borrow from China, we borrow from you know, Europe. And so a lot of the money we borrow, we don't owe to ourselves, we actually owe to other countries. And then of course the yellow area is other. We've been talking about social security and Medicare. In the past, social security and Medicare were running surpluses. And when they ran a surplus, they would buy government bonds. And so a large portion of our, debt, of our debt currently is held by Social Security and Medicare. Now, over the next 30 years, they're going to cash all of that debt in to pay benefits. And if they cash their bonds in, somebody else has got to borrow, uh, we have to borrow the money from somebody else to do that. So that means the public and 
the Federal Reserve and the rest of the world are going to have to buy the, the debt held by the other uh, by the other trust fund programs. And so what I said was, well, how does holding this debt and building up this debt really matter? What if we didn't pay the debt off? What if we just kept rolling it over? If you have a have a, a loan and it comes due, instead of paying it off, let's suppose you just borrow it again. You you roll the debt over or refinance the debt is a term you often hear. Um, and so I said, what happens if you roll the debt over? And so what I did is I, I took what is a famous sort of economic theory. It's called the life cycle permanent income hypothesis. And a simple way to say that is that people would like to spend roughly the same amount of money over their lifetime. Now, so when you're young and you don't make as much money, you tend to borrow money, you borrow to, to pay for your college, you borrow to buy a house, borrow to buy a car. And then as you get older, you make more money, you can start saving and paying off a little bit of the debt. But presumably at some point in the future, people want to retire. And so when they retire, of course, they're not working anymore. They don't have any current income. And the only way to support their consumption and retirement, of course, is to save. And so obviously people think about savings as buying bonds and stock and putting your money in the bank. Well, obviously, one of the things that people could buy instead of buying, you know, Tesla stock or IBM stock or corporate bonds, they could buy government bonds. And so the question would be, what if people bought government bonds? Well, depending on how big the debt is, more of their investment portfolio would be government bonds and less of it would be corporate stocks and bonds. And that that's, goes back to the, tr the crowding out argument. If you hold more government bonds, you're going to hold less of everything else. Um, and so you see this in the savings data and in, in the life cycle data. And so you can see this line where the orange dotted line where I connect that, that works out to be about $30,000 a year on average. So over your lifetime from age 25 until you die, roughly say 80, 85, let's say 60 years. So if you spent $30,000 a year for 60 years, that's $1.8 million. So over your lifetime in constant dollars, uh, this is the average across all, all the people in the country, uh, about $1.8 million. Now, what happens to the economy if instead of buying stocks and bonds and helping the economy grow, investing in buildings and machineries and computers and, and growing the economy, what if you just bought government bonds that support the government to borrow money and pay for programs? Well, my analysis basically said that every time you increase the publicly held debt, which is the, the national debt held by the public, that crowds out private savings by roughly a ratio of 10 percentage points of additional debt reduces lifetime consumption by one percentage point. So if our debt were to go up, uh, say, uh, to 100% of GDP, that's not the total debt, that's the debt held by the public, lifetime consumption would go down by 10%. Now, as I just mentioned, if over the lifetime, the average person spends $1.8 million, 10%, that's $180,000 in lifetime consumption that would be foregone as a result of the government borrowing money. So, you know, I guess in conclusion, I would say that while the numbers are sort of abstract, you talk about trillions, you talk about the share of the economy, if you want to sort of boil it down to how this could affect people in the real world, you know, every time the government is running up the debt by 10 percentage points, if that reduces your lifetime consumption by 1%, that's you know, $18,000 over your lifetime. So there is a real cost uh, of the government um, borrowing the money and, and that can be interpreted or translated into how it's going to affect you know, the, 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 the average person. So I'm gonna close there, um, assuming I can... <laughs> I can get out of this. Let's see. Uh, all right. Where did my? Thank you, Steve. While you're while you're getting out of that, I'll just say, uh, seeing all three of our presentations today, it reminds me of uh, one of our three co-founders was the late great Pete Peterson. I mentioned him earlier. He was Commerce Secretary in the Nixon administration, and he used to love to quote Herb Stein, the economist, who said, "If things are unsustainable, they tend to stop." Uh, so we, we certainly don't want things to stop. So we got to figure out a way to go forward. And so with that, um, I'd like to bring him back in and we can uh, entertain some questions uh, as well. And Pamela, we'd love to hear from uh, anybody in your classroom, as well as any of the people who have joined us here in our live audience today. So uh, great thanks to each of the panelists. And at this time, we'll be glad to take Q&A.
Steve, I stopped your sharing for you yep. so that okay. we can get to the Q&A. Um, right. I, ha I have a quick question while we're waiting for people to put questions in the chat, which is um, really more about what we see in the news. So, um, you know, not to get political, but I would kind of love to have this full panel's opinion a little bit on who is better at managing the debt and the deficit historically and if there is a reliable resource that we can go to gather that data um, you can kind of find the answer to this question in whichever way that you want it um, and so i'm a little bit curious because um, of the the group we have gathered here if you have a little bit more reliable information on us from a political standpoint Let me let me take a crack at that. I mean, I, I, I think it's sort of hard to say that there's one political party that's done a better job. I mean, I think there have been members of each political party at different times that have have uh, you know done a good job or a bad job. So I don't I don't know that you can make a blanket statement that, oh, it's all the Republicans' faults because they cut taxes for the rich, or it's all the Democrats' fault because you know, they they want to spend more money on Social Security or Medicare or whatever. Um, you know, it, it's it's there, there's plenty of blame to go around. Um, and so I don't I don't you know, and then of course, the other question is, you know, even if you could attribute blame, uh, that's sort of looking in the rearview mirror. And the real issue is not, you know, how we got here and, and our, boy, aren't we in trouble? But the question is, what are we going to do about it? And you know, so I think the more appropriate question to ask is, you know, anytime some politician is, is um, you know, out on the campaign trail and he's saying, you know, vote for me, and you can ask him the question, well, so you know, do you do you think the national debt matters, and if if so, what do you plan on doing about it? And you know, this is one of those issues where, you know, no one single party is going to solve the problem. Um, and you know it's gonna it's one of those sort of political compromises because nobody wants to say vote for me I'll raise your taxes and cut your spending I mean that's not a winning campaign slogan but by the same token sadly that's what it's going to take to get a political compromise to address this problem you're going to have to do something on the revenue side you know whether it's closing loopholes or raising tax rates you're going to have to do on something on the spending side whether it's raising the retirement age or you know, some of the other the, the uh, ideas that Romina mentioned, I mean, there's no silver bullet, there's no magic wand that you can wave that's going to fix this problem. And I don't think there's any one party that can do this alone. Um, I mean, you know, the history is when you have one party controlling the Congress and the White House, that tends to be the time when you do you do things that make it worse. I mean, you look at you know, the, the tax cuts under Trump or the uh, Affordable Care Act under President Obama or the, you know, the big spending COVID relief bills, uh, you know, in the last Congress or even previously under, under Trump. I mean, you know, when emergencies come along or when the parties align, they, they tend to do something big and bold and that tends to make it worse rather than better. Or the prescription drug plan passed under, under President Bush. Um, you know, there are plenty of examples where they've made big, bold efforts to make the problem worse, and there are less examples of, of when they've made bold efforts to make it better. I like the answer. It's complicated. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> it's like the old, the old economist joke, well, on the one hand and on the other hand. And I, I do think, exactly. though, um, and Steve, I agree with most of what you said there, that there is one um, aspect that is underrated, and that is creating political cover for politicians on both sides of the aisle to make the tough choices that are necessary to fix the fiscal situation. Because um, I think we have good examples in the past for, with, for example, the base closure and realignment commission that when you set up a mechanism that brings both parties to the table and especially in a way where the outcome of their negotiations are those are transparent, but the actual process at which they arrive at their decisions, um, that can be more helpful to have behind the scenes, because I think one of the big challenges we're facing is that we live in a highly polarized nation. Um, you, um, 
it's not going to be one side or the other. I agree with you on that. But also, I think that the, the visibility and the transparency that we've introduced in the congressional process of legislating, while on the surface seemed like a good idea, um, in hindsight, I think it has led to more political grandstanding and fewer uh, negotiations to actually arrive at a governing compromise. And um, behind the scenes, you can get uh, politicians on both sides of the aisle to recognize that we do have an entitlement-driven spending crisis. And um, especially those with some knowledge of economics will grant that entitlement reform is absolutely necessary. And that, there, I think it comes more down to not just asking individual politicians what they stand for, because here again, you're putting them on the record, but creating a mechanism where well, legislators from both parties can come together, negotiate um, those uh, those reforms to those major entitlement programs, and like you said, throw in some some tax increases for good measure um, for bipartisan support. Um, but I think really that political cover is underrated, and we will not get to a grand bargain without it. A really interesting uh, standpoint. Then, did you have something that you wanted to say on this issue too? Yeah. And then we have uh, two questions in the chat, so. Yeah, I, I agree with both Steve and Romina on this. And I would just say that both parties have strong rhetoric on this issue. And when either party in, gets into a position of power, they and they have the ability to do something, um, like Steve said, raising taxes or cutting spending is politically unpopular. And um, they tend to take the easy route. Um, and pass the buck. And so, um, and I think for me, um, and this kind of parallels with what Romina said about the importance of political cover, um, in our current environment, I get concerned because the issue of debt and deficits has just uh, become less and less prominent uh, and fewer politicians seem to care about it. Um, and so it's really important that young folks like on this call um, really highlight with their lawmakers how important it is to them because um, folks in our generation and in younger generations are the ones who are gonna have to deal with this problem the most. Um, and we're already dealing with it because like Romina highlighted, we've got this entitlement program problem that is not only driving an increase in deficits, but it's also squeezing out all the other dis forms of discretionary spending that benefit younger people, things like education, child poverty programs, welfare, things like that are, are becoming less prominent in our budget because many of our programs that largely benefit older generations are the ones that are taking up most of our spending. So in the chat, we have um, a couple of questions and a solution or a suggestion. Um, so from our friends at North Cobb, we have a suggestion of having a national lottery in terms of being able to add to the federal revenue. Um, so feel free to address that. We'd also like to know a little bit about um, suggestions for reforming these entitlement programs other than simply working longer periods for longer amounts of time um, and for more years. And then as a follow-up, we have a question about social security and sustainability. If it needs to be replaced by something else in the future, um, do you think that it should simply be replaced by another type of program? Or do you think it's uh, just a revamping or as you were saying, working longer hours? So these three ideas are kind of combined if you wanna address those. And then I know Ramina has some questions about immigration as well. So we, let's start with Ben, if you don't mind. We'll go back around the opposite way. So on the question of Social Security, and I think Romita and Steve can probably speak more to this than I can, but um, I don't think we need a completely new retirement benefit program. Um, the, the reforms that are needed for Social Security are relatively straightforward um, to help balance the revenues that are coming in and the checks that are going out. Um, for me, I hit on one of them, raising the retirement age is uh, one that would certainly help. Um, although as time is as time goes on, the less and more folks are retired and collecting benefits, the less of an impact that will make 
Um, another one is our payroll tax base um, is uh, people pay payroll taxes on the first one hundred and thirty so thousand dollars of their earnings, um, and that could be increased to a higher level so that more higher income folks um, pay into pay more into the program. And then there are other reforms you can do to make it more targeted to lower income, make a more progressive benefit structure, adjust how you change how you change benefits with as wages and inflation changes over time. Um, that can help bring, uh, make things stack up so that um, the program has a more sustainable future. Thanks. We have a few minutes left. Romina, Steve, do you want to take a, a stab at this question? Let me just say something real quick about the lottery. Um, you know, G Georgia, as I understand, has a lottery that they use to pay for college. And, you know, the 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 one of the one of the dangers that you run is anytime the federal government steps in, uh, quite often it's the state and local governments that get squeezed out. I mean, if, if you were to implement a national lottery as a new source of revenue, well, the question is, okay, I'm, in, I'm a citizen in Georgia. Do I buy a Georgia lotto ticket or do I buy an Uncle Sam lotto ticket? And if uh, I want to buy both, do I just split my money and give some to the Georgia lottery and some to the Uncle Sam lottery? And so the question becomes, you know, how much additional money could the federal government raise from a lottery that wouldn't, as a result, squeeze out a lot of the state and local lotteries? And then they, in fact, would then be hurting for money. So this would in, in turn out to be a transfer from, from the state money to, to, the, to the federal money. And so, you know, and of course, the other problem is a lot of a lot of economists don't like the lottery because statistically, your odds of winning the lottery are so small uh, that that it's just it, it, you're throwing your money away for the most part. So unless you're doing it for some charitable reason or some, you know, you're motivated because you want to help the, the kids go to college. From a financial perspective, lotteries tend to be a regressive tax on the poor in terms of. Who gives up the biggest percentage of their money to play the lottery? It, it's it's lower uh, income people as opposed to the higher income people. So it's it's sort of a regressive taxation, and it could very well uh, hurt state and local governments. So I'm not I'm not sure how much money you'd ultimately raise and what sort of the unintended consequences of that would be. And I see Romina has put her comments in the chat. Um, do you have any final closing thoughts? Yes, on this question of uh, replacing Social Security and I, I would add Medicare there as well, while there are uh, tweaks that can be made to make both programs be more sustainable over the long run within the context of um, reducing the unfunded obligations, I think in the big picture, given that Social Security is now 87 years old, um, it would be worthwhile to review the core purpose of this program, which I think should be to prevent old age poverty and to reform the program accordingly, while recognizing that in the financial services sector, we've gotten to a point where it's so much easier for working Americans to save for their own retirement through automatic savings and index funds, targeted retirement funds where they don't have to have financial advisors, they don't need to know exactly how the system works, um, where Social Security no longer serves the purpose that perhaps was envisioned for it in the past when it was expanded to become more of a broader part of the retirement system, but rather should focus on old preventing old age poverty and otherwise leave Americans free to save for their retirement in accounts that they own and control, which um, would also benefit particularly uh, lower income and uh, populations of color who have uh, and individuals who have shorter life expectancies because when they die, their social security benefits just go back into the general pool. Uh, it, but their private savings and amounts that they own and control and 401ks and similar retirement vehicles, that money they can pass on to their descendants. And so I think that is a that is a key part that is often uh, missed, that when the government runs these programs, um, that uh, that means a huge loss, especially to those uh, lower and middle income Americans of color. <laughs>
Thank you so much. And I know we're at our time. And so I do want to thank everyone for being here with us today, particularly our panelists and for the think tanks that have shared them with us today. Um, in particular, I want to encourage the, the high schoolers we have on the call, if these are the types of things that you are interested in, um, there is a place for you in, in these public policy style debates, as well as um, you know being the next generation that helps us address all these questions. Phil, do you have any final words, closing thoughts? Just want to thank everybody for being with us today. If you're interested in these issues, please check out our website at concordcoalition.org. Sign up for our newsletter, listen to our podcast. And uh, Kim and I were just talking earlier, we, we're going to make sure that a recording of this will be on her YouTube channel, on uh, the West Georgia YouTube channel, and on the Concord Coalition YouTube channel. So hopefully we get as many eyes as possible on today's discussion. Pamela, thank you so much for joining us uh, from your high school. And oh, look at all the students waving at us over there. Thank you all so much. Those are the people that are going to save us right there, guys. <laughs> so, Kim, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have put in the chat um, our next webinar. We hope you'll you'll join us. We'll be talking a little bit about preparing for financial hardship, so things that you can do so that you don't have to rely on um, government and Social Security to take care of you in the long run. We appreciate your time you spent with us today. Thank you, everybody. We hope you have a wonderful Monday and a wonderful rest of the week. Bye-bye.